Sunday School class, and we are glad to have a special guest speaker with us this morning, and it's Dr. John Marr, goes by JP, Pat Marr's son, and we're glad to have him with us today. They've been in missions and now pastoring uh, since 1998. He is uh, administrative pastor at Reeves Baptist Church in Reeves Junction, Minnesota, and so we want to welcome uh, Dr. Marr here this morning, JP, and uh, come and share the word, brother. Thank you. Do you know if there's magic markers? Okay, right here. All right. Um, I'm too far away. I, that's just the way it is. I'm just too far away. I can't do too far away. There you go. Um, so how's that? Can everybody see this? Okay. So uh, this morning, I, uh, I'm going to take you through probably something different that you don't normally do in Sunday school. Um, but I think you're going to enjoy it, actually. Um, we, um, we are created uh, pretty unique, aren't we? Um, the intricacies of how we're wired, what we like. Um, no two people are alike. Thank goodness. Although many times in marriage we try to get our wives or husbands to be like us and that never works. Um, some of you are saying, what's he talking about? The reality is uh, you can find this in Psalm 139, right? Uh, it says, let me read it to you. <clears throat> it says this. Psalm 139, verses uh, 13 and 14. Um, I went to your favorite Psalm, 119. Why did I do that? Uh, okay, Psalm 139, uh, verses 13 and 14. That says, for you formed me, you did form my inward parts, and you wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. It's clear in scripture that there are many things we don't understand about how God made us, right? I mean, it's true that a lot of us are fearfully made, right? <laughs> Uh, and we may struggle with believing that we're wonderfully made, right, at times, um, because of how we're treated or things like that. But what I want to talk to you about this morning is in two, two, two uh, parts. Uh, the first part is this, the Bible, okay, the Bible and your brain, you think, wow, that doesn't sound very spiritual. Um, it is because God created you, and your brain is very unique and intricate. And I often wonder, um, like, you know how when you go through things in life and you know that you can go to the Word and you read the Word and you finish reading the Word and you think, that didn't do anything. Did I miss it? Okay, let me read it again. Uh, you don't have to admit it. I know everybody, that, that happens to everybody. Where is it, God? Show up. And, and what happens is we go through these things and we look for answers, but we don't know what's going on in this unique thing that God created in us. We're all unique. How our brain works. How the Bible works with the brain. So first I'm going to give you a science lesson. Because I believe that if you know what's happening, it's easier to handle it when it does happen. Okay? And I'm going to end up at one verse, and it's in Philippians chapter 4. And everybody knows the verse, but let me, let me give this to you first. Okay. Um, I was going to use my mom for an example, but I don't, I don't need, I, I was going to draw her out, but I'm not going to do that. Okay. Okay, so this is your brain, right? Everybody see that? This is your brain. Um, some of us have 
smaller brains, some of us have bigger brains. Um, th this is your brain, okay? And in your brain, the way you were created, there's all, or in your body, there's all kind of systems, you know, that, that work, that keep you, like you're sitting here right now looking at me and interacting with me because there are systems at work in your body. You're able to do that because God is sustaining those systems. Your heart's beating, right? Your mind's wandering. What's he talking about? You know what I'm talking, you, you're, you're doing it right now as you're looking and focusing on me, your, your brain is working. And so there's a bunch of systems in, in, the, in the body, but this one particular system I'm very interested in because it's a part of the work that I do as a counselor. And I counsel lots of people with some messed up situations and they don't know where to turn. <clears throat> and they're confused. They say, I'm just confused. The brain is jumbled. Uh, you may have been there. I've been there myself. You know, like, what's going on? I don't understand it. So it's called this. You may have heard of it. It's called the limbic system in the body. The limbic system. The limbic system is a very interesting thing because it's the smoke alarm for the body and uh, the mind. Uh, what its main role is, is when something goes wrong, something traumatic happens. Okay, let me review that. You lose someone close to you. That's traumatic this system starts to kick in. And God designed it to work a certain way. And if you know how it works, when those things happen, you can say, oh, that's what he's doing. And for me, I like to have the answers. I don't know about you guys, but I like to be prepared, have the answers before I go into anything. Yes, I got that from my mother. Um, our brain is very much wired that way. Like if something happens, traumatic, it can be something traumatic that happened to you when you were young. It can be current. It could be something that you're concerned about in the future. Well, this limbic system, the way God designed it, works in a way to alert you that something that's not normal may be coming. Um, and the verse we're going to talk about uh, associates with that. Okay, so how many of you like science? Sweet, I'm in trouble. Okay, um, so there, there's this, uh, the limbic system has uh, four or five different parts, but there's two main parts. Okay, two main parts in the limbic system. Um, the one is called the amygdala. How many of you have ever heard that? Amygdala. The other one is called the hippocampus. What does this have to do with the word of God? <laughs> God created these in you. He made this. He made you with this. That's what it, it It's you were fearfully made. He put these in you by design for you to handle things that you're not expecting. How gracious is he, right? So we have these two things, amygdala, hippocampus. Everything that you experience, you're listening to me talk right now, right? And you're trying to process everything that you experience during the day. It doesn't, no matter, it, it doesn't matter what it is. It has to go through this, the amygdala. It processes everything, everything. It, it, it sorts out emotion. It sorts out problems. It tells things where to go, what to do. This is the gatekeeper of information. Let me just say this to you. In your brain, you have a file cabinet. You do. Good memories. Bad memories. Let me give you an example. Have you ever ridden down the road? This is, how, this is how your amygdala works. You're riding down the road, the windows are down, and you smell a certain smell that reminds you of something. And then you say, hey honey, do you remember that time we went to that place and we got those really awesome donuts? You know that happens, right? The, 
this just kicked in because one of your senses alerted the amygdala of a memory over here. God created all, God did all this stuff. He, and, and he said, hey, remember that good memory? Here's the unfortunate part. Sight, taste, touch, hearing, smell. Those are the senses, right? The unfortunate part, your senses can also bring up bad memories. I'm going to give you an example. Not really a bad memory, but I remember this. It was really weird. Why? And I, this has happened to me a couple times. Um, I, uh, my parents were in New Tribes for a long time, and we went to uh, uh, the training center. They called it boot camp. Uh, in Oviedo, Florida. Okay, so 1975, hot. We live near an orange grove. I come home one day. My dad had killed a snake. Okay, he thought he was going to be real funny. Um, and he left the snake out in front of the house, and I was riding my bike up to the house. And I was, the weird part, I was 10. I'm 56, and I still remember this. <laughs> and it wasn't necessarily a bad memory, but... It makes me leery of a certain thing now, and I'm going to explain it to you. I'm riding my bike, and the trash bin was burning, and I could smell it. it had like a plasticky smell. Riding my bike up, and I look down, and there's this dead snake. Like, my feet didn't touch the ground. I catapulted off to the side and walked down. I'm like, there's a snake in the house. And my dad's like, mm, you know, like he's really funny. Do you know to this day when I smell pl burnt plastic? I think of a snake. Isn't that weird? Has, does that ever happen to you? Like when you're a little kid, those memories, those, those things are lodged in your memory. God did that on purpose. He did that on purpose. Why? Because you're wonderfully made. He wanted you to interact with life and, and, and have life and allow him to live life through you. But he uses these systems to be able to do that. Unfortunately, because of sin, Genesis chapter 3, we have to deal with the bad memories now, too. It kind of messed the whole thing up. But God had a design that still works. So, so here's the, um, I'll, I'll kind of draw it for you. Uh, here's the amygdala. It's a little thing like this. And it's attached to the hippocampus. The hippocampus looks like this. And it transfers the amygdala, takes the information, and sends it to the hippocampus, okay? The hippocampus takes that information and tells it where to file itself, good or bad. That's why I say you have a file cabinet in your head. Okay? Under normal circumstances, it works really, really well. For some of us, too well, because all our thoughts always have to be organized. And if you like have OCD that way, I raise my hand. I do. I'm like I, everything has to be. I have to have it in order. I mean that helped me in school, of course, uh, but a lot of times it's detriment because I can't forget things. And so this this little thing that God created, that's the gatekeeper of the mind, communicates information to what's called the hippocampus, and the hippocampus takes information and tells it which side of the brain to go to left or right, okay? And it sits there and it tells you how to interact. That's how, well, actually, the specific part of the brain it goes to is the frontal cortex. The frontal cortex is responsible for all executive function in the mind. You make a decision, it, the problem came into the amygdala, the hippocampus recognized it, it went to the frontal cortex and you made certain choices hopefully good ones, <laughs> because of the process and information that you already have. God designed you that way. That's normal. You're not weird. You're not crazy. You're normal, okay? I can't tell you how many of my clients I say that to. They'll, say, so they'll, they'll come in my office and they'll say, JP, I feel like I'm going nuts. I'm like, you're not going nuts. Your brain is working just like God designed it. Let's go back and talk about the information that we put in there. And that's what we're going to get to, the Bible and your brain, how all that works together. So th I, 
this is like, people spend like eight years figuring this out, you know, in school. This is a real, like, on the top surface, okay? I'm just giving you a skim over. So we have these two things. Okay, so um, there's another thing. You may have heard of this. It's called the thalamus. Anybody heard of the thalamus? You take biology? What's your name? You take biology, Allison? How did you do? Uh, a B or C? A. a. Decent. That's pretty good. You take biology? Did you take biology? Did you like it? No. Have you taken it yet? You have? Do you like it? No. Okay. Okay. We're in trouble. Okay. The thing of it is, every, some of the things that you're being taught, you think that they're not associated with God. They are. Science is associated with God in a very real way. The science of the brain is because he designed it that way, specifically for you. But there are times when we go through things and we think, am I thinking right? Like, what's wrong with me? Like, I don't know if I can handle this. How many of you have said that? I've said that to myself. You, you lose somebody dear to you or an event happens and let's say somebody's in a car crash and you love them and you're like, I don't know if I can handle it, the information. So here's what happens. When, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna label it uh, just generally trauma, okay? Because trauma, what we call trauma, in my line of work is when something goes wrong outside of the ordinary. It can be big T or little t. I don't have cornflakes, I have fruity pebbles. That's a little t. Okay, that can be a little trauma. The big T is, man, I lost somebody really close to me. That's huge. But the, it's weird because our brain processes those big things and little things differently. The big things that are really tough, what happens is the amygdala takes over completely. It takes over. So there's kind of like a, the amygdala is here and the hippocampus is here and there's like a, a fuse in here. How many of you have gone through something you feel like the, your brain, like you can't stop your brain from thinking and the, and it, and it feels like a fuse is blown. You're like, I can't get that to work. What's, why won't it work? Why won't it reset? The amygdala has taken over to help you process this stuff that you face. Now, there is an answer. There is an answer. You guys know this verse. These set of verses, actually. Philippians chapter 4, turn there with me. So I just explained to you in 15 minutes, or less, 20 minutes, kind of how the brain works. Okay? Kind of. That's just like a skim over of the limbic system, real brief. If, if you don't, here's what I would say. If you're wondering how this, Google it. You'll find it there too. I didn't find it there. Um, I actually did it the hard way and went to school. <laughs> um, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. How many times have we quoted this verse? Let me read it to you. Be anxious for nothing. Don't be anxious. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Okay, so you've gone through something. You're struggling. You lose a loved one. And we love to do this as Christians. We're not in, the pla we're not in that person's position, but we'll walk up to them and say, Oh, don't be anxious. It'll be okay. Everything will be okay. Have you ever had that happen? And you're standing there like, 
I mean, you just want to wrap your hands around their neck and you're like, no, it won't. I don't feel like it's going to be okay. You with me? But the Bible says to us, don't be anxious. So a lot of times people will say, well, I don't believe in anxiety. I do. The Bible says don't be anxious. Don't have anxiety. So how do you do that? Every single client that I have, every one of them, I got about close to 80 right now. Every single client struggles with anxiety. And they say to me, why can't I shut my brain off? Because your brain wasn't designed to shut off. And you know what happens when you try to shut it off yourself? I'm going to be completely honest with you. People start taking drugs and they become alcoholics because they want to numb the pain. I mean, people say, well, I don't understand that. I understand it. I get it. When the pain is so deep and they don't have hope, they go to the closest thing that will give them hope, the bottle. That does not work. And, of course, they end up in my office. And I'm like, hey, that doesn't work. But I know something that will. And so our brains work this way. It doesn't matter if you're a super, super mature believer or you're a baby, baby, baby Christian. This doesn't know about that. It just knows about information. Okay? When you're going through something that's hard and you're anxious, how many of you, okay, so we're in church, so it's usually not a good thing to lie in church. How many of you have ever been anxious over anything? Here's what it looks like. Um, you guys know my mom, right? M Mrs. Marr. Um, when my mom is anxious, I know. You know what she does? That's what she does. It comes out in her body. This is taking over, and it's telling your body to do certain things to handle those things. Some of you may be anxious, and you're like this. Comatose. You disassociate, right? You're like, I don't, I don't know what to do. And you, you, you get in this state where you're like, I don't know if I can handle it. What's going to happen? Um, what I do, babe, what do I do when I'm anxious? This is always funny. What do I do normally? Um, mm-hmm. I will walk. I, will, I can't sit down. I'm like... You've seen this in movies, right? You guys going like this. Super anxious. I sigh. That's what I do. And my body, I don't even realize I'm doing it. Sue will look at me and say, why are you sighing? What is wrong? My body is telling others that I'm struggling, that I'm anxious. Do I want to be anxious? I don't. I don't. It's much better to not be anxious. I can't sleep. I can't eat. I don't want to go to work. I feel like kicking the dog. I mean, you know, all kinds of stuff. But there's an answer for us as believers. If we know what's happening in our mind in these systems, these unique systems that God is creating, if we understand it, when he says in Philippians... Don't be anxious. God would never tell you something that he cannot accomplish in you. He would never do that. He's not that type of God. When he says don't be anxious, he gives the solution. And the pe be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with, your, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. But I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and, and God is not, I don't see him anywhere. He's not showing up. Uh, anybody? Does that happen to me? Pastor? Does that, I mean, you pray. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm at this, man. I'm going at this. And I'm still feeling a little bit anxious when I get done. And I'm thinking, wow, what's going on? God would never put me in that position because he created me. 
So I know that he's given me an out to be able to handle this, so how do I do it? And, and he gives those instructions right here uh, in these verses. By prayer, supplication, and be thankful. Wait, wait, hold on. I'm anxious right now, and you're telling me to be anxious about the thing that I'm struggling with? Or be thankful about the thing that I'm struggling with? Uh, yeah, that apparently that's what he's saying. It could be just for you that he's trying to do something in you. So here's what happens. Okay, back to science. Um, something's going on. The amygdala processes it. And this processes feelings, too. Those of you who think you don't have feelings, you do. You do. It's a simple. I had to realize it. Yeah, I thought he's a tough guy. You don't know. You can get hurt. Man. You don't have any feelings. That is not true. That's a lie from the pit of hell. God designed you specifically to feel a certain thing in a certain way. So something happens. We're struggling and we're anxious. So trauma, anxiety, um, fear. It, it generates all kinds of stuff, okay? And so when that happens, this part of your brain is the gatekeeper, and it shuts off the flow of information to the hippocampus, because remember, the hippocampus delivers all the information to your frontal cortex, to the executive part of your brain to be able to make decisions. When something wrong happens, have you ever heard somebody, like they're struggling or an event happened, you ever heard somebody say, I don't know what to do, I just can't think right now? You ever heard that? I just can't think. When you hear that again, you should think, yeah, that's God designed it that way. Because in moments of trauma, when our brain isn't working properly, most of the time you make a bad decision. You will make a bad decision. This happens in relationships, this happens at work, this happens at life, it happens in every area of the world that you live in. And so it can shut off. And when it shuts off, um, there's all these thoughts like in your brain with no place to go. We call that suspension. Have you ever tried to go to sleep and you go to, you lay in bed and you think, why can't I get to sleep? You're laying there and then you start thinking about something. You're like, and next thing you know, you roll over and it's 3.15 a.m. And you're like, oh my gosh, why can't I get to sleep? I need to get some sleep. These things that are going on in your brain are floating around with no place to go. They can't find their way into the file cabinet, so they have to go somewhere the neurons create these electrical impulses millions of times a second that make you think and make you do all, and all that electricity in your brain is just and you're like, ah, I can't shut my brain off. What's going on with me? What's going on with you is God is protecting your brain from harm. He doesn't want the trauma that you're dealing with to end up somewhere here. But here's the reality. A lot of times it does. In my practice, I have, um, how many teens now, Sue? So probably 10, 10 teens, three or four preteens. Um, I, I had a, a, a person recently that has gone through something traumatic and it happened early on in his life. His brain wasn't fully developed and somehow these Memories over the course of time that kept coming has, have found a home in his mind. And um, he, he can't get out of the jail. He can't get out of the jail because he doesn't know how to handle the, the ideas and the thoughts. And he doesn't understand. And so guess what? You might laugh at this. I teach him this. I say, hey, you know what's going on in your head? Let me, let me show you. He's like, really? Is that what's happening? And I can see this little glimmer of light coming in his eye. I see it. And I'm like, okay, this, 
I mean, if you're like, it's like, I'm like a mad scientist. I'm like, sweet, this guy's gonna do it, man. He's gonna do it. I mean, I get excited. And as what happens is, many times older, older people, look, you, you've lived life a little bit. You remember things when you were five that were good and bad. Uh, we were hanging out at the house. Uh, in, uh, at my house, and we were talking about, my, my mom was telling me about what it was like growing up, you know, telling us stories, you know. My, my kids love stories. My grandkids love stories. I've heard them a thousand times, but I still listen to them. Um, and she was saying, you know, I remember, like, we didn't have any water in our home growing up. We didn't have a bathroom inside. And she was saying, I remember going into this room and we walk in the back hallway and the back hallway was lined with milk cartons and it had water in it. That's where, that's where my granddad kept the water um, with 12 kids, 11 kids. Mm -mm, not today, 11 kids, <laughs> no. And so those memories, my mom's 84. She can remember that when she was under 10. Why? because it lodged itself in here, it, it, it found a home. And so when we're talking about certain things, mom will say, you know what, I can remember when I was a little girl, you know how that goes, and then she tells the story. God created your brain that way to remember things, good things, bad things. And so many times, if we're going through something horrible, this little part of the brain, it sits right at the base, of the stem of the, of the brain, up towards the middle of the neck, in behind your throat here, like right in here, right up in there. That little thing does all of that for you. So the question is, if that's true, and God says, hey, I know you're going to be anxious. Philippians chapter 4, don't be anxious, okay? How do I do that as a believer? How do I get past the point where things, events, uh, don't bother you? Um, let me give you a few examples. And, and, and this, this has caused anxiety even with myself and my wife. Um, the first time that my daughter took my car. Oh, oh man, that was horrible. Driving. My teenage daughter learning how to drive. The anxious was not the word. I mean, I was like close to flipping out. You know, I'm like, oh my God, is she gonna wreck? Is she gonna kill somebody? Is she gonna kill herself? Like, I'm like does she even know how to do this? Um, and it generates anxiety in us. Um, sending your teenage daughter off to her first prom. Now, that's not anxiety, that's called anger at the boy that's taking her that you wanna kill. Okay, I get that too. It all processes through here. And guess what? Here's the really unique part. Men and women are wired differently, and this works differently in men and women. For instance, my wife and I, uh, when our kids were younger, uh, they would be outside riding their bikes. We lived in the city. And I would say, they would say, hey, Dad, can we go ride our bikes? And I'm like, yeah, sure, no problem. Well, they're like riding all through the city, up the street. And Sue's like, where are the kids? And I said, well, they're riding their bikes. Well, where are they riding their bikes? I don't know. They'll be all right. No problem. Well, Mama didn't think they would be all right. And so she went into anxiety mode. Where are they? We got to find them. Get in the car. Go, you know, and I start to get all the instructions. I'm like, all right, my bad. All right, get in the car. Why? We process things differently. We get anxious over different things. Uh, interestingly enough, um, many times women get way more anxious over relationships than men because they're more in tune emotionally. Trust me, that's how it works. Uh, guys are like, eh, whatever, it'll be okay. And you're like, I don't... Is she going to like me? I don't know if I get there. I'm just really anxious because if I get there, will she like the dress I'm wearing? And I'm not really sure if my hair is that way. I hope we don't wear the same thing because we're at the same party and wear the same thing. She might not think, 
That's, that's how I want, I mean, that's like textbook. Textbook. Guys are like, eh, I'll throw a t-shirt and some jeans on. I'm good. You know, no, I don't care if somebody likes me or doesn't. I'll wear my flip-flops, you know, whatever. <laughs> and when you're getting ready, your wife will say to you, you're wearing that? <laughs> you, right? We just, we don't freak out. Men don't freak out over things like women do. And we should thank men, you guys in here that are married, you should thank God you have your woman. And the way that he designed her, because she protects you from a lot, trust me, from being dumb and doing dumb things. Because she's more in tune. Why? Because this works differently in her brain than it does in yours. That's just how men and women are wired differently. So let me go here. Where's my Bible? Okay. Philippians chapter 4. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. I want to talk to you for a minute about guarding your heart. A lot of times anxiety comes from you not being careful of what you think on allowing things to take over your brain that shouldn't take over your brain, that you should be more aware of, that I'm not going to go down that road because I know if I go down that road, I'm going to worry and I'm going to get anxious. And many times we just do it, um, I want to say the word willy-nilly. Do you guys know what that is? Like cavalier, <laughs> willy-nilly, whatever. Um, and, and, and once we're there, we're like, oh my gosh, I, I, how did I get here? I don't want to... I don't want to think. We have to guard our hearts. Guard what you allow to enter here. Guard it. Have you ever heard this statement? <sighs> I don't do drama. You heard that? I have clients who say that. I don't do drama. They are like drama kings and queens, let me tell you. They don't want to do drama, but they don't have any way of preventing themselves from getting into the drama. They don't guard themselves. They don't protect themselves. Um, you don't see me, uh, well, you, most of you don't know me that well. I don't do a lot of social media. I don't. I just won't. Is it bad? No, not necessarily. Can it be bad? Oh, yeah. Can it be detrimental? Very detrimental. I have teenage clients who are really struggling because they didn't get that last friend request. Or they didn't look at my TikTok. Okay, whatever, TikTok, you know, give a dog a bone. I don't know what that is. Like, why don't you stay away from that stuff instead of allowing yourself to get drawn into it, into something that's going to make you anxious? Let me just say this. This is not just un unchristian un un kids, kids that are not believers. This is also believer Christian kids that this, hap this happens to. I'm telling you, I counsel them all the time. I just, it's, I'm just struggling because she doesn't like me and she, she defriended me. <gasps> and I'm like, so? She defriended you. And that means what? Were you friends to begin with? And so what I do in my work is I try to do this, okay? Change someone's thinking. If I can change, if I can influence somebody to think differently, I know that they have a chance to not be anxious or struggle or get worried. I know, because here's what happens. How you think, how you think determines your attitude towards a specific thing. And you know where it comes out? In your actions. You're worried about something. 
your attitude is an attitude of worry. You're, you're like, man, I just don't know what to do. And your body is responding and saying, wring your hands, because that's the best way to deal with it for my mom. Sorry to put you on the spot, mom. But you might have seen her do that. Or me. I didn't guard my thinking. I, I just let anything in there. And it's starting to control me. And the unfortunate part, um, I, I have, I, I'm connected with a lot of schools up, up at the, uh, up where I live, and um, they send me clients. And this is really, really, really a, a big problem in our teenage education system, um, how they teach kids. Um, I almost believe they don't want them to think for themselves. I think they want to create robots. Um, but I believe that God designed us differently, and he wants us to think. He wants us to use the brain that he gave us. So we should be training those kids. And I, I see a lot of kids who don't know how to think, and they find themselves in a heap of trouble for many reasons. It's unfortunate. So as a believer... You have hope, right? You have hope to not allow this trauma to affect you in a way where it sidelines you. If you change your thinking, it changes your attitude. And it comes out in your actions. It does. You may not see it. If you're wondering, ask your husband or wife. They'll tell you. They're very aware of it. You come home from work, something happened at work that out of the normal and it messed with you and it caused some sort of, I wouldn't say major trauma, it's the little T. And all of a sudden you walk in and you're like, as soon as you walk in, you slam the door. She's cooking dinner and she goes, something's wrong, right? You walk through the kitchen she says, hey, babe, how are you? I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> None of you have experienced that, I'm sure. I, I knew that sometimes. You know, and I have to recognize, okay, that's, okay, what I'm dealing with is now coming out in my actions, and it's also affecting other people now. Now we've complicated the problem. By not just keeping it in our mind, it, we've spread it to somebody else like a disease. And so we got to be very careful. What's the answer? How do we do this? How do we, how do we guard this unique thing that God created? And how do, we, how do we actually change our thinking so that our minds work the way God wants us to work and, and processes things in a way that honor him and glorify him and we're not anxious over things, but we're allowing him to control the, how do we do that? I mean, I've been, I've been a believer for a long time since I was a kid, okay? I'm a pastor. I'm a doctor. I have a degree in education. Um, I know a lot of stuff. Uh, I do. I know a lot of stuff. 90% of it's not worth anything. But I know a lot of stuff. That makes no difference when this starts to kick in. None of that matters if I don't protect this. Philippians chapter 4. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension shall what? Guard your heart and your mind. It guards your heart. You have to guard your heart and your mind with certain things so that your brain can function properly so that you can live a life that honors and glorifies God. God is not honored when we're anxious. He's not. Why? Because it's just a complete statement of saying, I'm just going to worry about this because obviously God's not doing anything, so I might as well worry about it. He is not honored that way. So how do we get through this? How do you do that? How, how do you guard it? Okay. How do you guard your mind and from allowing all this stuff to happen? Oh, by the way, when all this stuff is in suspension, you know, you're going through something traumatic and 
this fuse breaks and the amygdala um, is now preparing you for a reaction. They call it flight or fight syndrome. You're getting ready for you to do something. You're anticipating having to react. When this happens, all these neurons that are creating these electrical impulses are just floating around in your brain. Um, I'm going to tell you, and I'm not, I, I, know, I know that some need this. I'm not, I'm not against it. I'm not, I'm not saying against or for. I'm just saying this is what happens. If you go to, at least the majority of time that I've heard and read, if you go to a secular psychologist, okay? Not that some of you may have been. I've been. One of the answers is I want to put you on some pills. Now, I get it. Sometimes we need pills. If you have cancer, you have to go on a certain thing. If you have, you know, um, trouble with your blood pressure, you have to go on pills. I'm not saying that you shouldn't do that. What I'm saying is a lot of times that's not the answer. Um, my wife and I have been to the doctor. And um, can, I, can I tell this story about you? You good with that? You still going to fix me lunch? OK, <laughs> sweet. Um, we went and they told my wife that her sugar was high. They wanted to put her on a pill, a thing. And, and we said, no, we're going to try something different. We're actually going to go on a diet. <laughs> we're going to watch what we're going to watch what we allow in. Her sugar came down 100 points, didn't need the medication. Why? Because, now, sometimes you need medication. Of course, I'm not against that, of course. Sometimes you need it. I'm, I'm not saying you don't. What I'm saying is there's always an, an alternative. There's always an alternative, and especially when God is involved. Okay? So we, we decided not to do that, and we were both kind of healthy. Babe, we need to get back on that, by the way. Um, if you change how you think about a certain thing, it changes your attitude towards it, and it comes out in your actions. Let me continue reading. Um, I just lost it. Here we go. Philippians chapter four. How do you how do you guard your heart and your mind? A lot of times we don't keep reading. I'm going to keep reading for you. Finally, brethren, whatsoever is true, whatsoever is honorable, whatsoever is right, whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever is of good report, if there's any excellence and if there's anything worth praise in your life, you need to focus on those things. That will change your thinking. I can tell you for sure. Here's what I know. The body and the brain, very unique. Okay? very intricate, designed like we can't even understand. One of my, one of my heroes is, you, may, you, you guys know Ben Carson, you've you seen him on TV. Um, he actually lived in uh, Maryland where we lived. I was, I've actually been to his house. Um, he is my hero, strong believer, um, but I, you talk about smart. This guy, way beyond, I mean, I'm, I, like, I'm in the wrong ballpark. I, I feel like I shouldn't even be there. But he understands this in a way, how it relates the Bible or your brain and how the Bible works with your brain. We call it, I'm not going to write it down, we call it neurotheology. I, I, I studied it a lot. I keep reading. I keep learning. And it's how the Bible affects your brain. In this one area, it can affect it greatly by doing this one thing. Whatever things are true, think on those things. It can affect everything. Now, let me just say this. You have the word of God, okay, live, breathing, alive, sharp, sharp. It can cut. It can also heal. Do all kinds of things. We have the word of God, and then we have us. As humans. Many times we read the Bible. That's why I asked you at the beginning, you ever read the Bible? You're like, that didn't help. You know, we struggle. Here's what I know. 
when we focus on things that are in God's word, whatsoever things are true, you're in a situation and you know that it's going to create some anxiety. If you back up from it a little bit and you begin to think about what's true about the situation, you lose somebody, okay? Let's say you lose a person close to you, and that's difficult. You lose a spouse. Very hard to navigate. This happened with my wife's parents. My wife has lost four people in her family in the last 11 months. Mom and dad, aunt, cousin. And I see her do this. She gets emotional and she struggles that they're gone. But then I see her back up from it and she'll say, well, I know they're with Jesus. That's true. And that truth, I can see it at work in her. I watch her. And I can see this thing come over and she's like more settled about it. Like, yeah, my parents are gone, but they're with Jesus right now. Is the trauma hard to lose somebody? That's absolutely hard. But if we back up from it for just a second and think, what's true about this situation? Like, is this the end? As believers, of course, you know this is not the end. This is just the beginning. Come on. We we're in, man, we're in store for something big, which I'm excited about anyway. Um, but th these, these truths that we, if we back up from and we, and we recognize what's true about a situation, a lot of times, I'm going to call it supernatural because the word of God does a supernatural thing. It changes us. It affects our thinking. It changes our attitude, changes how we respond to people. And so this supernatural thing starts to work in us. And, and I'm sure Pastor has taught you about like when you get saved, you have the Holy Spirit in you, right? He comes in, he, he, he takes residence. Hey, I'm here. Thanks for the new residence. <laughs> Appreciate it. Now I'm going to run your house, right? This supernatural thing is at work because the Holy Spirit in you is moving you towards him instead of, and he's saying to you, hey, back away from, from that thing that's hurting you so bad. I, I, can, I can take care of that. What's true? I love you. I care about you. Um, I, I still am interested in your life. I'm still going to uh, allow you to walk and grow, and I'm going to allow you to live. Like, if we back away from it and allow the word of God, as the spirit of God uses it, whatsoever things are true, as we allow that stuff to come in our brain, guess what? It starts to work normal. Oh, yeah, I'm a child of God. Yes, I may have lost my husband, and I miss him so much, but he's with Jesus. Hippocampus. Woo! Good memory. Right? Something that I don't understand. I, I, do, I have been to many, many funerals, believer funerals and unbeliever funerals. And when I go to unbeliever funerals, people that don't believe in Jesus, I think to myself, um, these people have zero hope. Zero. You see them there and they're, they're crying and they're mourning. I have clients that are unbelievers that have lost a spouse. I'll be honest. I know a lot of stuff, but I don't know what to tell them other than, Maybe you need to accept Jesus as your Savior first, and then we can have something to work with. But I can't give them hope. That's the saddest thing. Because as believers, when we understand how all this works in us and is designed, it's like, man, this is pretty cool the way God did this. And that's just with humans. Think of all the animals that he designed weird. I mean, you know, who would have thought of a platypus? Come on. That, that's crazy. Why, why would, like, that animal, of all things? Um, but the thing to remember is this. The Bible has the ability to impact your brain in a practical way that can allow you to navigate life. Okay, you're 19 years old. How old are you? How old are you? 17. You mind if I pick on you a minute? My name's JP. You can pick on me back if it's okay. Um, you're, you, you date? You, you, good for you. You're smart. Okay. Do you, do you date? Wow, that, this is good. Train them upright. Sweet. Keep them away from... You know, girlfriend, no? Okay. So, let's just say 
that you met this guy that is just googly over you. I mean, he's just like, oh, Brent's charming. Oh. <laughs> You're with him for eight months. You're all in. Your emotions are all in. And you think that you're going to spend the rest of your life with each other. And one day he comes in, you come into school, and you see him walking down the hall with another girl. This is a real scenario. So I have clients that I've had to work this. And they are devastated. Major big T trauma. He doesn't love me anymore. I hate this other girl. Oh, you know. And next thing you're at home, your friends have to come over and console you because you're overdosing on uh, tasty cakes or whatever it may be. Um, and, and those things affect you, especially when your brain isn't fully developed because it's not working properly yet. The brain isn't fully developed until you're 25. You can look it up, read it, search it. It's just the way it works. And so... These things that happen to teenage girls, teenage guys, I can remember when my wife broke up, I'm, my wife now, broke up with me when I was in high school. I was devastated. I really was. I was devastated. Number one, because my mom really wouldn't let me date anybody else, which, you know, go figure that. Um, no, I like Sue. You know, I'm like, okay, I'll marry her. You know, so, I mean, that, that was devastating to me. And I still remember it. I remember it. And the thing of it is, we have to understand that we're going to go through these things in life. Married, non-married, single, old, young, doesn't matter. But if you don't understand how your brain is working and how to navigate it, sometimes you'll feel lost, even as a believer. But let me just say this to you. There is an answer. The Word of God has an answer for anxiety and trauma and fear and frustration. And that is the Word of God itself. Whatever things are true, whatever things are good, whatever things are pure, think on those things. And this supernatural thing starts to take place, and all of a sudden, this releases, and the fuse is reinstated, and the hippocampus starts working normally. And this thalamus, or hyperthalamus over here, that was about ready to release, you know, that, that energy chemical that you get, what do you call it? Come on. What do you call it? You call it when somebody's exercising, you get this, you like, you get all hyped up. What's that called? Adrenaline. adrenaline. That's right. Hypothalamus. It's ready to put the adrenaline out there for you to handle it. It, it kind of puts that back in the jar and says, okay, we don't need that right now. We're, gonna, we're working normal, right? We're working normal. And it all comes from allowing the word of God to change your thinking. How? By focusing on things that are true and good and pure and lovely. The Apostle Paul didn't just write Philippians chapter 4 for nothing. He wrote it because there was a severe problem with people being anxious. Don't be anxious. Come on. But do these things. Okay. So the, I'm done. I'm two minutes over. Um, if you have any, I'm going to hang out for a little bit after church. So if you have any questions or comments or you want to tell me that I'm, I've lost my mind, you can do that too. Um, uh, but that, that's no problem. I appreciate uh, being you listening to me. I know this is a little bit unconventional, um, but I, that's just my style. I mean, I like, I like to make it practical and pragmatic. You know, how can I use it? I want to be able to use the Word of God, not just read it. I want to be able to use it so it affects my life. And I, I haven't even talked to Pastor about this, but I guarantee he would say to me, yep, that's right. That's why I do what I do every Sunday. I want them to use the Word of God to change their life. Okay, let's pray. Father, we're grateful for who you are. We're grateful for the fact that you made us so intricate and so wonderful and, and, and designed things in us to work in a certain way. I pray, Father, today if there's anybody in this room that's struggling with anxiety, fear, uh, frustration, I pray, Father, this, was, th this could be used to help them move on and, and, be, and, and allow you and the Spirit of God to change their thinking. That's going to change their attitude and ultimately their actions. Father, we know that your word is sharp, it's powerful, it's quick, and it, it can heal, it can hurt, it can, it can change us, it can and help us grow and learn and point out things in our life. I pray today that your word will be used in that way in this place with these people. And we 